this class is, uh, you know, I named it, I think, nine or ten things every millennial should know about socialism. And uh, uh, a lot of you are not millennials. Uh, you're, we, I think we're at the tail end of the millennial generation. I, I've been reading, they're, they're trying to decide what to call you now. Is you going to? Yeah, I think the millennial generation, what is it, everybody born after 1983 or something like that. And so uh, so uh, you'll have to figure that out. But uh, but I wrote this book. Uh, oh, by the way, you, you probably have received the email by now that you will not be permitted to leave Auburn, Alabama, unless you purchase a copy of my book, The Problem is <laughs> with Socialism. And, uh, but I wrote this book when uh, uh, Regnery Publishing uh, contacted me after uh, Tom Woods, uh, they contacted Tom, but he's too busy with Tom Woods Incorporated uh, to write another book. <laughs> and so he, he, he recommended me. <clears throat> and, uh, and they said, you know, they, they read across these uh, uh, opinion polls. One of them, uh, a 2016 Pew Foundation poll found that 69% of voters under the age of 30 uh, expressed a willingness to vote for a socialist president. And there are a number of other polls like that. So, you know, the so-called millennial generation that went crazy over a, a 74-year-old communist who spent his honeymoon in Moscow in the middle of the Cold War, Bernie Sanders. Uh, it was sort of a, sort of a, a weird development that, that there is sort of, a, you, know, uh, you know, after all the world has gone through with socialism in, in the 20th century, here we have the, young, the younger generation uh, infatuated by someone like that. In, uh, and socialism in general. And I would have to assume, though, that a lot of them didn't know what it was. And a lot of these young people <clears throat> were, were Ron Paul followers when Ron uh, was running for the Republican nomination because he's also anti-establishment. So a lot of them, I think, just thought of themselves as anti-establishment. It's just a good thing if you're anti-Washington establishment. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but they didn't have any really intellectual background to understand. Well, what am I for? I'm against that, but what am I for? You know, you, how could you how could you be more different than being for Ron Paul one day and Bernie Sanders, the old communist, the next day? That, that doesn't make any sense at all. And uh, uh, Bernie, by the way, was a high school classmate of, uh, of Walter Block's, and they ran on the same track team. And although Walter said Bernie was faster than him, <laughs> and Walter has been challenging Bernie to a debate for about three years now, but he he just uh, seems to ignore him. He's not not too interested. And so, so that's why I wrote this book. The book was written. That's Pinocchio on the front cover. And the the problem with socialism, as this as he pointed out, should have been problems plural, but. It comes from a, a quotation from Margaret Thatcher, the late uh, Prime Minister of England, who once said, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. And that's sort of where the, the title of the book comes from. And so I thought I'd go down, you know, as many of these nine or ten things uh, as I can get through in the time that I have about what I think young people like you, if you talk to your classmates about this, if they say, gee, oh, God, I hope Bernie Sanders runs again for president or something like that, like that, what would you say to them? Well, first of all, you, you, you should buy the book, like I said, or, or else you won't be able to get on the bus back to the airport. And, uh, and, and there's, I can't cover everything that's in the book. But uh, I'll go through some of these things. So first of all, what is socialism? Well, it began in the early 20th century as uh, government ownership of the means of production. And that's that's when all the socialist calculation debate took place in the, in the great debate over socialism. But then it was expanded be, far beyond that. In uh, in his famous book, The Road to Serfdom, uh, in the in the 1976 edition, Friedrich Hayek wrote that uh, before too long, even by the time you got to the 1940s, uh, socialism had been redefined as income redistribution through the welfare state and the progressive income tax. Uh, and the objective, he said, was always the same. The ostensible object, objective was always egalitarianism. It was always the, the, an attempt to equalize society. Uh, but the means just changed. The means, they, they gave up on, a lot of socialists gave up on the whole idea of taking over uh, industry and running it, uh, especially in the United States, where the, the working class, so-called, in the United States, was never interested in taking over the factories like uh, Marx and Engels insisted. They just wanted a pay raise. They, didn't, they weren't interested in, in all that. So they redefined socialism to mean that. So that's the second part of the, uh, the definition. And then also, 
in in Ludwig von Mises' fa- famous book, Socialism, which is for sale out here, I assume, and it's online. In some of the latter chapters, he talks about what he calls destructionism. He said it, it has always been a part of socialism, wherever you, you see it, is to first destroy the institutions of capitalism, including uh, the institutions of liberalism, That mean that meaning the ideas that support economic freedom, okay, peace, free enterprise, equality under the law, and, and so forth. Uh, those things, those ideas have to be destroyed and the, and the institutions of capitalism have to be destroyed uh, through taxation, regulation, inflation, whatever means possible, propaganda uh, and, and, you know, re-education of the public, uh, you know, to hate capitalism and to love socialism. That, has, that was always seen as a prerequisite first. Then you can try to have socialism. And so my definition of it is, is broader than just government ownership of the means of production. It's also the welfare state and the progressive income tax and destructionism. Okay, so, so that's why my book has 16 chapters. It's not just a book about the calculation debate. That's actually a tiny, tiny part of it. Uh, the second thing, second point is socialism will destroy your economic future. Uh, and, and we have a lot of history of that. I talk about some of the history in uh, in the textbook, uh, so I have a, oh, here's my hand up, and of course, in the Soviet Union is the biggest the biggest example of this uh, in world history. Our our friend uh, Yuri Maltsev, who who has lectured here, uh, he's a professor at Carthage College in Wisconsin now. I just saw him a couple weeks ago in uh, in Florida, and uh, he uh, he was a, a an advisor to Mikhail Gorbachev, who defected. And he ended up being a friend of the Mises Institute and an Austrian school economist. And, and how he came to be that is that uh, uh, one of his jobs working for Gorbachev uh, was to read the literature of the capitalist bourgeois exploiters and criticize it. Mm-hmm. And so he had unique access. Yuri once told me that if, you got, if a Russian citizen got caught with a copy of The Road to Serfdom, there was a seven-year prison sentence just for having that book in your possession. And he read it in a mimeograph form and then passed it on right away to somebody else who wanted to read it. But so he knew about all this literature. And so he was a free market economist when he defected in the late 80s. And uh, and he's the guy who convinced Dick Cheney, uh, the U.S. Se- uh, defense secretary at the time, that the Soviet economy was no more than 5% of the U.S. economy. So you had the the, the the richest country in the world in terms of natural resources, including human beings, you know, a huge population, uh, producing basically nothing. Uh, I once asked an MBA class of mine, well, what, what product could you name that the Soviets uh, produced that was a, a worldwide, uh, you know, competitive on world markets? And I had some military people in the class because uh, there was a military base near where I was teaching, and they said AK-47s. Yeah, AK-47, but, but no consumer good. That's that's the only thing they can think of. It, and maybe caviar, but that comes from a fish and not a factory. So that, that's the worst, biggest example. All over the world, uh, <clears throat> socialism is a disease. You know, and uh, you know, students need to study this and, and know this. Argentina <clears throat> developed their brand of socialism in the 40s under Juan Perón. And, uh, they, and that, that imploded. And uh, the, the Argentines uh, tried to bail themselves out with massive government spending and printing of money for decades after that, ending up with uh, 12,000 percent inflation by the 1980s. And but that all got started with the implosion of uh, of per- Juan Perón's uh, uh, socialist uh, uh, project. India was once one of the wealthiest countries on earth. Uh, with uh, a lot of uh, brilliant uh, engineers and, and, and people of all, of all kinds, of all trades, and very wealthy. And, but then after colonialism, uh, they adopted Soviet-style central planning as their model. And, they, and the rest is history. They became one of the poorest countries in the world until Rajiv Gandhi helped them, started turning things around, what was that, 20 or 25 years ago in, uh, in, in India. Uh, Africa, the same thing. After colonialism uh, ended in Africa, they all also moved uh, into socialism as a, a possible answer. And, and so country after country also became, you know, among the poorest countries of the world. Uh, <clears throat> the la- one of the latest examples, of course, is uh, Venezuela, of the wonders of socialism, uh, where uh, in 
Well, Hugo Chavez uh, nationalized all the major industries and a lot of not so major industries, imposed price controls, regulation, socialism. Uh, it's only, uh, you know, not even 20 years ago they did that. And Venezuela uh, ha has uh, is reportedly uh, has more oil than Saudi Arabia. And so it was a very affluent country, a Latin American country, and they've totally destroyed the place. Um, here, here's one article from the London Telegraph uh, describing today's Venezuela. Uh, it says, explosive government spending combined with declining oil prices made Venezuela a dead hell. As Chavez and his successor, Nicolas Maduro, refused to admit uh, the folly of their ways, today a hamburger costs the equivalent of $170 because of hyperinflation, a night in a hotel is $6,900. A middle-class monthly salary savaged by inflation are worth about $35 in purchasing power. Food prices more than tripled just in the past month, and the annual inflation rate is 4,505%. Uh, one Venezuelan interviewed by, by The Telegraph said that he had to spend more than half of his monthly income just on toilet tissue. And, uh, you know, you can read articles on the web about people in Venezuela uh, rummaging through garbage in the street, competing with dogs for looking for something to eat out of garbage piles and, and, and hundreds of thousands of people leaving the country. And that only took about 15 years to uh, to do that to a, what was once a, a fairly prosperous uh, country. And so there's no and there's no shortage of examples of that. If you want to destroy your economic future. Well then, socialism is the ticket for you. Let's move to Venezuela. You can you can you can see your economic future quicker than if you just vote for Bernie Sanders and be a Bernie Sanders supporter. Okay. Uh, the third lesson is that you cannot fix uh, uh, socialism any more than you can reform kudzu. Uh, those of you who are, have never been here down south in Alabama don't know what kudzu is. It's that weird vine if you, on the highway from the, air, from the Atlanta airport to Auburn. You might have noticed that uh, there are these vines that just completely come over all the big pine trees. It's called kudzu, and it just like grows like crazy. You can't kill it. You can't, can't trim it or anything like that. You have to pull it out the, by the roots and then burn the roots. And, uh, and that's the only way to get to do some, anything about socialism. Can, and, of course, the reasons why you can't reform socialism – or the inherent reasons that you, you've learned a lot about that this week, I assume, there's the, calc the uh, calculation problem that you've all been, uh, been uh, you know, or knowledgeable about uh, now. There's also the Hayekian knowledge problem, the idea that, uh, that uh, the kind of knowledge that makes an economy work is the knowledge of time and place, that it's in the minds of the millions of people, the consumers, the producers, the workers, the entrepreneurs, the financiers, and everybody – and that no one mind or no one group of people could possibly possess and utilize in an efficient way all that information. And Hayek called that the pretense of knowledge in his, in his last book before he died. And so that's the knowledge problem. And that's different from the calculation problem. That's more to do with the absence of market prices and being able to calculate profit and loss and those sorts of things. And then there's the famous incentive problem. You know, how do you, how do you give people an incentive to work if everyone gets paid the same, uh, if, uh, if if uh, if I'm a professor in a in a in a college class and I tell the students that uh, okay we're going to have six exams during the semester and at the end of the semester I'm going to add up all the scores and divide by the number of students and give everybody a C, you know what what incentive would you have to study if you know you're going to get a C? If you study a hundred hours, you get a C. If you study one hour, you get a C. You know what's and that's that's socialism, basically. Okay, so, so these are the inherent reasons why you can't fix socialism. Uh, and, and it's remarkable how some economists don't know this. Uh, I remember reading an interview in the New York Times with uh, years ago with Joseph Stiglitz, who was uh, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, chairman of his president of the Council of Economic Advisors. He was, he was the uh, head of the World Bank for a while, I believe, a famous uh, Princeton economist. Uh, and so a real establishment, kingpin, Nobel Prize. And the whole gist of the interview in the New York Times was that he thought, and this was this was after he left the Clinton administration and after the worldwide collapse of socialism. The gist of the interview was that he thought he could, people like himself could make socialism work, that uh, they just didn't do it the right way. <laughs> and so, so he learned nothing through history or economics. And the, 
this is somebody you know, supposed to be a big shot economist and doesn't understand a, a darn thing about it uh, to say something like that, it seems to me. Okay. Uh, point number four is uh, democratic socialism can be just as disastrous as any other kind. Uh, my Venezuela example is an illustration of that. Uh, that was a democracy uh, as far as that goes. So you can, uh, in, in his famous uh, pamphlet, The Law, Friedrich Bastiat uh, commented, this was published in 1850, Bastiat said that uh, uh, democracy can be just as, uh, as bad as communism if what democracy means is you pass a law that imposes one system on the whole population and then uses the coercive force of government to keep that one system imposed on the population, well, that's what communism does. And so you can have the same results of, of uh, communism or socialism uh, as far as that goes, but with democracy. And, and by the way, I don't, I don't really distinguish between the two. It's all the same gang to me, communism, socialism, because after all, the Soviets called their government the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They didn't call it the Union of Soviet Communist Republics. They, they considered themselves to be socialists because communism was the utopian ideal that they hoped to reach someday, maybe in 100 years. But even the Soviets never called themselves communists. It was they, they called their government yes, Soviet, Soviet Socialist Republics. Okay, and so that's that's sort of a, a a red herring argument to me because some people will say, "Well, you're criticizing socialism, but communism is yeah, it's bad. Yeah, but socialism is different." Well, no, it's not. It's, it's just the same same beast as far as that goes. Um, see, I had a little. Yeah, Hayek made the point in, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave Hayek later. That's, um, Hayek made the point about, uh, about this, uh, you know, The Road to Serfdom. There are, there are several chapters in his famous book, The Road to Serfdom, about this point, about democratic socialism. And, and he, he talks about how uh, democracy inevitably is uh, incompatible with, with socialism because what happens, uh, what tends to happen, among other things, is that Okay, the, you'll, you'll impose some sort of central plan on society, and then the plan will fail, and then the government will face a choice. It can either abandon the plan, or it can adopt dictatorial powers to keep, keep the system going, to sort of force more and more on the population. In Venezuela, for example, democratic country, they, they're talking about uh, forcing all the adults in the country to spend two months uh, on a farm somewhere working because they're out, they're running out of food, and and so you know, so it started with price controls and a nationalization of industry, and now 15, 20 years later, they're talking about literally enslaving a large part of the population, uh, like chattel slavery, and forcing them to work backbreaking farm labor to feed the population, and so uh, so it's either that sort of thing or just abandon and, and admit that you failed. And politicians are rarely inclined to do that, aren't they? And so, so that's uh, Hayek's argument of how uh, of one of the reasons he gives several others of why uh, democracy is essentially destroyed by socialism, even if it's adopted by a, by a democratic country. Okay. Uh, see, the next point I would make is. Uh, Socialism does not produce equality. It produces just as much inequality as, as any other system, maybe even more than any other system. For example, uh, I read not too long ago in the Wall Street Journal <clears throat> that the wealthiest person in Venezuela, socialist Venezuela today, is the daughter of the late Hugo Chavez, who is reportedly worth $4 billion with a B, even though she never had a job and never ran a business. And, uh, and also the, the Chavez former finance minister, who now lives in Europe, according to this article, is reportedly worth $11 billion. And, there, and the same article had a big, uh, long discussion of the political cronies of Hugo Chavez, who were still uh, at their country clubs, living high in the hog, having, you know, you know, eating well, having pig roast at the country club tonight, and that, that sort of thing, driving Mercedes. Uh, but the people are living like animals, and in the, in the, in the, as far as the animals go, they're starving in the zoos too, and people are eating dogs and, and cats in the, in Venezuela. But the politically the politically connected are doing very well. It's always been that way. 
Uh, Joseph Stalin was the richest man in the world during his time. He essentially owned the entire Soviet Union. You know, people will say, no, it might have been John D. Rockefeller or, or you know, his, his heirs or somebody like that. No, it was Stalin. Nobody, nobody owned more property than, than he did in, in his time. And, of course, in the Soviet Union, all the, all the, uh, the uh, top politicians had uh, uh, resort homes and secret bank accounts and all the rest and lived very well. And everyone else is equally miserable. And there are a couple of interesting quotations that I, that I put in the book about this, about equality and egalitarianism. It's a couple of my favorites, actually. Like I said, the, the book's written for a popular audience. It's not written uh, because I want to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Okay. H.L. Mencken, this is one of my favorite H.L. Mencken quotes about e the whole subject of egalitarianism. He said, all government, in its essence, is a conspiracy against the superior man. Its one permanent object is to oppress him and cripple him. If it be aristocratic in organization, then it seeks to protect the man who is superior only in law against the man who is superior in fact. If it be democratic, then it seeks to protect the man who is inferior in every way against both. One of its primary functions is to regiment men by force, meaning not just men, men and women, to make them as much alike as possible and as dependent upon one another as possible to search out and combat originality among men. All it can see is in an original idea is potential change and hence an invasion of its prerogatives, that is, the government's prerogatives. The most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself without regard to the prevailing superstitions and taboos. And that's uh, any, you know, egalitarianism anywhere, no matter where, where you're talking about. And then another quote that I, I stuck in here on this top of the chapter, uh, that my chapter is entitled Egalitarianism Versus Human Reality. And, and I recommend, if you're interested in this, read uh, Murray Rothbard's essay, uh, Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Nature. It's uh, very informative, a lot of good economics in it. It's on the web. You don't have to find a book or anything like that. And, and Murray Rothbard quoted Kurt Vonnegut in this essay. Uh, the the uh, the American uh, uh, literary figure Kurt Vonnegut, in his essay called Harrison Bergeron, uh, about uh, e equality, and here here's uh, what Vonnegut said: it's, it's a novel, you know, not a novel, but it's fiction, work of fiction. Uh, the year was 2081, and everyone was finally equal. They weren't only equal before God and the law; they were equal in every which way. Nobody was smarter than anybody else. Nobody was better looking than anybody else. No one was stronger or quicker than anybody else. All this equality was due to the 211th, 212th, and 213th Amendments to the Constitution and to the unceasing vigilance of the agents of the United States Handicapper General. And so, so what did the Handicapper General do? Uh, here's an example. Hazel had a perfectly average intelligence which meant she could think about anything except that she couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. And George, while his intelligence was way above normal, had a little mental handicap radio in his ear. He was required by law to wear it at all times. It was tuned to a government transmitter. Every 20 seconds or so, the transmitter would send out some sharp noise to keep people like George from taking unfair advantage of their brains. And that's... <laughs> And that's a good that's a good lesson in that sometimes uh, humor or making fun of the egalitarian the socialist egalitarians is a good way to criticize them, and I have found that they hate that more than anything else, and so therefore I enjoy it more than anything else when, I can, <laughs> when, I, when you can ridicule and make fun of them because they take themselves so seriously all the time, and, and so humor is is a is a can be a very powerful weapon. You know, why do you think why do you think they put Comedy Central on TV and all these all these all these comedians, you know, with the with that what's her name holding the head of Trump up in in the, in the stuff like that. They think it's funny. They think that was not a very effective uh, tactic the, the the severed head thing, but but that's uh, but that's what they do. And okay, where am I? Uh so uh also, socialism has been responsible for some of the worst crimes in human history. I'm, I teach a course, I'm teaching it in the fall, called Capitalism and Its Critics. 
And I used different books all the time. But in one year, I used The Road to Serfdom was one of the books. I had the students read that. Well, it's very hard. It's not easy to read. So I had to spend a lot of time in the class explaining explaining the book. Uh, but then after that, I had them read uh, The Black Book of Communism and write papers about it. And, th and this was a book uh, uh, written by seven French scholars. It was translated into English in the uh, sometime in the mid-90s, I think. And uh, it just details the crimes of, under communism, and it showed why, why it was that uh, in order, you know, in the name of, of uh, imposing socialism on the people, that these governments had to mass murder hundreds of millions of their own population, of their own people. Uh, it was an essential part of socialism for the whole 20th century. Uh, and and uh, let me see if I can find the uh, page number here. And it's an example of the chapter in A Road to Serfdom of uh, where, that, where, that Hayek called uh, Why the Worst Rise to the Top. I think it's chapter 10 in the, in the Road to Serfdom. Why it is that under these socialist regimes, whether it's fascism or socialism or anything else, uh, you see the worst uh, rising to the top. And, and basically, uh, the basic reason, one of the reasons is, is that uh, the essence of socialism is the imposition of a, a government plan or a set of government plans on the population that will replace their own private plans for their own lives. And so you, you have to use force and coercion because people don't like to have their lives and their own personal plans disrupted and, and, and so forth. That's why the Ukrainians, for example, Stalin had to murder six million Ukrainians. They wanted to be farmers. They wanted to keep their farms. They didn't want to give their farms over to the, to the government. And so they, they killed six million Ukrainians, for starters, in the, in the 1930s. And so, uh, and so, and my students were uh, my students were totally unaware of this. They they didn't know that a single person died under communism. It seems like they were never taught a, a darn thing about it. They were, and uh, you know, at first they couldn't believe it, and then they uh, then they got into this book, and uh, and uh, and I had them write short papers on pick any one country that's discussed in this book and explain to the class the rest of the class uh, how they went about enforcing socialism in. Cuba or, or wherever the country, because that's what the Black Book of Communism does. Each chapter is a different country once you get past the first couple of chapters uh, in it. Let's see. So as far as the death count, uh, you don't have to buy a book. You can go online and Google R.J. Rummel. His book is called Death by Government, but his website is, is, uh, talks about demo side. So if you just Google demo side, you'll find this website of R.J. Rummel. He was a sociologist at the University of Hawaii who has probably had the most depressing academic job I've ever heard of. He spent his whole career researching how many people were killed by their own governments for being dissenters, not sent to war, not World War II deaths or Vietnam War deaths, but people who were murdered by their own governments because they dissented to socialism, basically. And, and it's a big, long list. And let's see... Uh, and, you know, one of the uh, comments about this that I make in my book is that in the academic world, the socialists, if, if, they, if they do anything, who, who, who totally dominate higher education in America now and most other countries, they always take the moral high road. You know, the capitalists and the defenders of capitalism, they're, they're the ones who are evil. If you defend decentralized government like Jeff Dice just did, you're a neo-Confederate who probably wants to secretly bring back slavery you know, because you're a decentralized government, you know, the state's rights, oh my God. Uh, okay. and, so, and so they always take the moral high ground, and yet they are the ones who are associated with the worst crimes in human history, socialism. In the in the mass killing of all the people who descended to socialism, how does that happen? How, how are they how are they uh, taking the moral high road? Uh, according to, to uh, 
This is from the Black Book of Communism, not Rummel. But Rummel's is the easiest to get a hold of. You don't have to buy his book. It's online. His website's online. The uh, Soviet Union, 20 million people. China, 60 million. Vietnam, 1 million. North Korea, 2 million. Cambodia, 2 million. Eastern Europe, 1 million. Latin America, 150,000. Africa, 1.7 million. Afghanistan, 1.5 million. And now these are people killed by their own governments for merely dissenting, not not being sent off to war or anything like that. And uh, and so, and that's an important point, I think. If you want to, if you if you ever get into a debate about socialism, uh, how how can you defend that? You know, that's that's the real history of socialism. Okay, and of course the defenders are always uh, they always like to defend it on theoretical grounds, not not uh, realistic grounds. Okay. Another point I would make is that uh, fascism is a form of socialism. After all, Nazi, the word Nazi stands for national socialism. You know, and the only difference, the big difference between the Nazis and the Soviets is that the, uh, the German socialists uh, claimed to be national socialists, whereas the Russian socialists said they were international socialists. That's the only difference, really. They're, they're all socialists. They all came from, from the same roots, and they all hated capitalism. They all, they all criticized capitalism. And uh, whether it's Italian fascism or, uh, or uh, German fascism or Japanese fascism or any other kind, it's, it's a form of socialism uh, as far as that goes. Uh, you know, I, I think it was Stalin who came up with this false dichotomy of, uh, of fascism being different and socialism, because, uh, you know, after after Hitler uh, double-crossed him, he was originally with Hitler, uh, but then Hitler double-crossed him and invaded Russia. But, uh, yeah, but so they were, they, were, they were on, you know, on the same page for a while because they were just socialists with minor differences between them. One's national, one's international. Maybe Stalin thought he could talk Hitler into joining him and being international, but uh, it didn't quite work out that way as far as that goes. But um, let me read you some examples. This is number seven. From this, from the horse's mouth, That's, here's Benito Mussolini. Let's see. I get the right. Oh, yeah. Mussolini wrote a book. When I was doing research on this years ago, it was kind of funny. I ran across Mussolini's autobiography you know, that I read. And it, it, the title was kind of like, if you were, say, a third grader and your teacher said, write an autobiography, what would you call it? He called it My Autobiography. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's Mussolini's biography. But, but this, his other book is Fascism, Doctrine, and Institutions. Okay. He said this, the fascist conception of life stresses the importance of the state and accepts the individual only insofar as his interests coincide with the state. It is opposed to classical liberalism, which denied the state in the name of the individual. And so the fascists understood that the enemy was people like Ludwig von Mises and Hayek and the Austrians primarily, classical liberalism. Uh, read Mises' book, Liberalism. He literally wrote the book on classical liberalism. It's online, liberalism. I'm, I'm using that in my class in the fall because I want my students to know not just what the institutions of capitalism are, but the philosophical underpinnings that allow capitalism to exist as long as a, a segment of the population understands these underpinnings. And, and, and it's these underpinnings, these, these ideas, that Mussolini was, was attacking here. And, and, of course, the German socialists did the same thing. Same, uh, they attacked the same ideas. Uh, well, that's all. I don't want to read uh, any, more, any more long quotes or anything like that. And so, uh, you know, like I said, the Nazis were national socialists. Uh, Hayek wrote in The Road to Serfdom that, quote, all of the leading men of German and Italian fascism began as socialists and ended as fascists or Nazis. So they just, it was just a minor variation as far as that goes. Uh, one other thing about socialism, you know, since I define it kind of broadly as being not just government ownership of the means of production, but also uh, the welfare state and the progressive income tax, uh, you know, I, I gave a talk at a, at a university or a college in uh, North Carolina in the spring, and uh, 
and I, and I was asked about this, about, uh, uh, well, how can I attack the welfare state? You know, <laughs> I attack the welfare state. And my response was uh, to give examples of how we treat people on welfare in Baltimore, where I worked for, ma for many years, where the public housing projects are, are so decrepit that uh, some of them, the police won't even go there because they get shot at. Or there, there are three or four generations of children who have grown up never seeing a man who gets up and goes to work in the morning. Is that really a good thing? I mean, there, there have been book. There was a sociologist who wrote a book about that in, in Chicago, about how there are three or four generations in some section of Chicago like this, uh, and uh, it kills off the work ethic. It, it destroys families because fathers are, are now off the hook. Once once uh, we have welfare checks replacing fathers, it, it eliminated the stigma. That well, there once was to abandoning your children, and so not all men will do that, but a lot do. If they think they're not going to starve, they're not going to not have a roof over their head. The government will take care of that. It's easier to leave. It's easier to to be irresponsible, and so so you have all these pathologies uh, that that we've been studying for many decades. And if you really get into it, you see you see the pathologies of uh, of this with. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in in lower income communities, especially, I think I cited one study that said that the teenage boys are something like three times more likely to uh, to get involved in crime if if they if they have a family like this that's been abandoned by their father. Uh, you know, we all know great examples of heroic people who avoided this, but we're talking uh, generalizations here about that. And so, so it's always easy for the socialists to, to play the sympathy game about the poor people. But uh, what the poor people want and need is jobs and, 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 and uh, you know, climbing up the economic ladder, first and foremost, uh, not, not handouts. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing I, I would I put. Uh, I see running out of time here. But uh, another thing I would mention is uh, the progressive income tax. Now, uh, in the Communist Manifesto, this is plank number two. So this was a high priority to Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto. You know, you know, next to the abolition of private property, a uh, a, a progressive income tax, uh, what, what they thought would would be a good tool for destabilizing societies. Remember, Mises said destructionism was always a part of socialism. Uh, what I write about in the book, though, is one of the things that the progressive income tax did was to nationalize all income. Think about it. When the United States adopted the income tax in the year 1913, the government was essentially saying, we now own all of your income. It's no longer yours. It's ours. And we will tell you how much of it you can keep by setting the tax rate. So you go to work and you're working for us. And if we decide the tax rate is 20%, you keep 80. If we decide it's 80%, you keep 20. But we'll tell you. We'll let you know what the tax rate is going to be. So the government essentially nationalized all income with the income tax. And another thing that, it, uh, that was a result of the income tax that most economists don't really discuss at all, really, is that uh, when we got, we got the Fed and the income tax at the same time, and of course that's another thing that's in the 10-point the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, platform of the Communist Party, and it's also in the 25-point platform of the Nazi Party. You can Google that. If you really want to become a Nazi scholar, you can uh, Google 25-point program. I have my students read it so they know what it was. Uh, was government control of money is, is always right up there. It's always a, an important thing as far as, as far as that goes, government control of money. But once the government has the ability to print money and the ability to tax however much of your income they claim to need, uh, well, they can do just about anything. Uh, they, they can bribe any governor, uh, any mayor who resists what they want to do, any community that resists what they want to do. They can impose military conscription for their wars, and if you run away from the army, they can send 100 men out to, to round you up. Uh, in the United States, uh, you, know, one of, you know, I've written a good bit about the American Civil War and all that. And, uh, there's one book uh, uh, written by a uh, a female Civil War scholar whose name I can't remember right now, but uh, on desertion in the Civil War, and it was massive. There were there were some of the big battles where the generals uh, in the in the the U.S. Army were on the eve of battle. They had eighty thousand men, 
And then the sun comes up and there's 10,000. You know, where'd they go? Where does everybody go? It's a massive desert, desertion, especially in places like the mountains of Pennsylvania, where I grew up, actually. That would be a good hiding place in the 19th century because it's pretty wild. It's like Pittsburgh over here, Philadelphia over here, and then it's all Mississippi in the middle, <laughs> and then Pe Pennsylvania. I, t I tell people I, I, I came from Pennsylvania. That's bad. They should have called it Pennsylvania. But but Abe Lincoln, even Abe Lincoln, didn't have the resources to send people out to round up the deserters. But you give them the income tax that we have now and and uh, a central bank, that's a piece of cake. And they could do that very easily. So they could do just about anything. So in other words, it, it created a massive centralization of power, which is why all socialists everywhere of all sorts are always – uh, dead set against decentralized government, secession, nullification, states' rights, whatever you want to call it, uh, and and they're always for more and more centralization of power in in, in the central state. Uh, the neocons are for that too because they think they can uh, as long as they see nothing wrong with a highly centralized, powerful state as long as they can be in charge of it. And I wouldn't, they don't call themselves socialists. They're just uh, evil statists. I, I would put them in that category. <laughs> but, uh, but, they're, but they're no different. But that's why you see, you see these. In one of my debates over Lincoln, and this is, I wrote two books on Lincoln, uh, I, I debated uh, the late Harry Jaffa. Hold your applause, please, when I, since I said the late Harry Jaffa. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he, I knew he had, before I went into the debate, I knew he always, he always had these sort of disgusting, uh, tactic of insinuating that anybody who disagrees with him it would be a, a Nazi sympathizer. He was kind of delusional, he was a Nazi. And sure enough, he did that with me. He said something like, oh, Adolf Hitler would probably agree with Di Lorenzo or something like something to that effect. Uh, and that's when I knew I won the debate. You know, if, you can, if you're that desperate to start <laughs> name calling, you know. And, but, but what I did was uh, I, had, I had taken a course in college on European history and the professor actually had us read parts of Mein Kampf, European history, uh, Hitler's Hitler's book. And I remember there was a whole big chapter on federalism and states' rights in Mein Kampf. So I went. I couldn't wait. I was in California for the debate, so I couldn't wait to get home because I because th I think I still have that book somewhere. And I got home and I dug that. I dug Mein Kampf out. So I, you know, in. Uh, if anybody saw me, they would think, uh, well, Jerry Jeff is right. Look at him. He's reading, <laughs> he's sitting there reading Mein Kampf. And I flipped through. Sure enough, here's, and here's Adolf Hitler paraphrasing Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address, uh, where, where Lincoln says the states were never sovereign. And Hitler used that to say, well, neither were the German states never sovereign. So we should not have any states' rights or federalism in Germany. He was making a case for a powerful centralized Reich in Germany. And he used Abraham Lincoln, of all people, as his, as his model in, in, in Mein Kampf. So I wrote up an article on LouRockwell.com called uh, Jaffa's Hitlerian Defense of Lincoln. So you can find it on, it's on the web, it's on LouRockwell.com. And so, and so the conclusion was that all the worst tyrants in history were naturally socialist tyrants in world history, were enemies of uh, divided sovereignty, states' rights, federalism, whatever you want to call it, uh, the things Jeff Deese just talked about in his talk, I and mean, these parts of it I was listening to from, uh, from the doorway over there. And so, and, and it's the income tax and the control of uh, the central bank that, uh, that enables them to do that uh, more than anything else. In, in democracies, not just uh, dictatorships, but democracies also. And my time's about up. Uh, maybe I have time for one question if, uh, or a brilliant uh, announcement or anything like that, uh, other than, uh, you know, when's dinner or anything like that. Okay, if not, well, that's it for now. Well, well.